This week on The Communicators, we learn about risks to security of data on computers at 24 federal government agencies. Well, recently, the Government Accountability Office released a report on the security of federal information and information on the federal websites. Greg Wilshusen is the Information Security Issues Director at the Government Accountability Office. It's his report, his and his team's report that came out. Mr. Wilshusen, how would you describe generally the information, taxpayer information, how secure that is on federal websites, as well as security information that the government keeps? Well, federal agencies contain a lot of sensitive information on their computers. You mentioned taxpayer information. There's also medical information, as well as classified and sensitive information uh, related to national security, national economic security, as well as business proprietary information on federal systems. This information is at risk of compromise due to a number of vulnerabilities on federal systems throughout the federal agencies. Uh, our review, which we issued last week in our, in our report, identified that weaknesses existed in key security controls at each of the 24 major federal agencies and departments. In your report, you wrote that in February 2011, the Director of National Intelligence testified that there had been a dramatic increase in malicious cyber activity targeting U.S. computers and networks, including a more than tripling of the volume of malicious software since 2009. Who's installing this software and what kind of damage does it do? Well, it can be any number of actors that do that. Uh, the threats to federal systems are growing and evolving, and these actors can include nation states, it can include criminal groups or organizations, hackers, potentially terrorists, uh, and in some instances, insiders, uh, employees and government contractors, either knowingly or unwittingly installing these types of uh, malicious software. And we'll explore that a little bit later, but uh, Jill Itoro is also with us. She's a senior reporter with the Washington Business Journal. Yes, um, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Um, one thing I noticed in the report is that you um, said that the uh, number of security incidents that agencies report has increased 650%. Um, that's a huge number. I know a lot of times that ex that's explained by better detection, but I know there's also quite a lot of uh, security incidents that go unnoticed. So how, uh, how should we look at that number? Is it as scary as it, as, as it appears to be? Well, clearly it's a dramatic increase in the number of security incidents. From fiscal year 2006 through 2010, the number increased from 5,500 to over 41,000 security incidents, as you say, a 650% increase. 30% of those in fiscal year 10 dealt with malicious software and the installation of malicious code on, on uh, federal systems and, and networks. And so this is a quite a significant issue and it can be both due to better reporting and detection, but also, as alluded to to Peter's opening comments, to an increase in activity in cyber events on federal systems. But you're absolutely right. Whether that's the actual number, whether there are a number of incidents that are occurring that remain undetected, I'm sure that happens. But you don't know what you don't know. And so the bottom line is, while it's been increasing quite a bit, we don't know still the full extent of it. And I know in addition to malicious software, there was also um, one of the, the top incidents reported had to do with unauthorized access. Yes. So, and you, you mentioned, of course, insider threats. How much of this is a technology problem in terms of not having the technology in place and needed to protect these systems versus a people problem where they're not, not following the rules or the policies? It's probably a combination of both. Uh, in terms of an actual ratio, per se, I can't come, I don't mm -hmm. know. But in terms of factors that contribute to this, certainly it's due to insecure systems and how agencies uh, configure and divide or, or configure their systems and, and devices, as well as individuals taking inappropriate activities, uh, either knowingly or, or again, unintentionally. But for example, plugging in a, a thumb drive into a workstation that may contain malicious code that can cause these incidents to occur. Mm -hmm. And then one other um, point you brought up was contractors. And we've heard in recent months about a number of contractors actually getting targeted themselves and their own systems getting exploited, um, varying degrees of um, exposure involved there. But is there enough policy in place 
for oversight of these systems or you know are contractors allowed too much access I mean how do you make that balance in terms of contractors assisting right. the agencies versus creating or in enhancing risks that already exist well you raise a key point because that really gets to the crux of information security it's risk management mm -hmm. balancing the cost effectiveness of security controls versus the impact it may have on operations with contractors they are a, a group that's particularly vulnerable or at least to federal systems because often as business partners we grant them greater access than we would to normal uh, public and that and so vulnerabilities in the contractor systems and that may lead to security attacks can potentially intrude into federal systems and federal agencies are required under FISMA the Federal Information Security Management Act to assure that the security over their information uh, whether on their systems or on those that are operated on their behalf such as contractors is adequately protected and we have shown in our audits as well as in the IG reports that agencies oversight of contractor systems and efforts needs improvement. Mr. Wilshusen, have you, uh, what percentage of federal agencies use contractors and what percentage uh, are contractors in charge of this federal information? Well, the percentage of the 24 CFO Act agencies, I would say every agency uses contractors uh, for running their IT operations. Uh, OMB issued a report on its FISMA implementation, uh, which is required to under law, uh, last year, or earlier this year, and it identified that about 1,100 of the 13,000 systems operated by the federal government, 1,100 of those were operated by contractors. In addition, of the IT personnel that were involved in information security activities, of which there are about 80,000 FTEs, a large percentage of those, particularly in the civilian agencies, over half of those were contractor personnel. So it's a large number of contractor personnel that have access to federal systems and information. And just to follow up on Jill's line of mm -hmm. questioning, does that lead to further security concerns? And what about the issue of cloud computing? Does that lead mm -hmm. to security threats? Well, certainly with the use of contractors, agencies need to be understand and be aware of the controls that they have in place to oversee the actions of those contractors to make sure that they adequately protect information systems and their information. With respect to cloud computing, I testified last week or the week before last on this at a congressional committee in which I indicated that uh, our reviews have shown that cloud computing can have both positive and negative security implications. On the positive side, the use of virtualization and automation techniques that are frequently used in cloud computing deployments can help improve security insofar as getting security controls in place quickly. It can also lead to low cost disaster recovery and data storage, which has been another security benefit that's been raised by uh, the federal agencies during our review. At the same time, though, it can also lead to increased security risks, particularly with respect that federal agencies now rely on these contractors or the cloud service providers to protect their information in the cloud, often which the, uh, the client, or in this case the federal agency, may not have visibility or control or access to their information in the cloud. So they're reliant on the security assurances and controls of the provider to protect their information. Still, federal agencies are responsible for assuring that security. Another risk that was identified is that uh, federal agencies expect to lose uh, or may lose information should the cloud service be terminated. There's concern about interoperability standards and the fact that once a cloud service implementation has been terminated, will agencies be able to collect their information and be able to process it through another service provider or themselves? You know, um you mentioned FISMA, and FISMA has received a lot of criticism mm -hmm. over the years in terms of being what some described as a paper-pushing exercise. There were some efforts to improve that by really emphasizing continuous monitoring of systems and networks. How far have agencies come in doing that? And then what about the next step, which some say is penetration testing, actually trying mm -hmm. to identify the vulnerabilities before they're exploited by the hackers? Where do agencies stand in terms of improving how they're handling their own cybersecurity? Okay. With respect to continuous monitoring, 
agencies still have a, a long ways to go to fully implement the capabilities of continuous monitoring in their environments. Uh, in as part of the recent uh, FISMA report and in our report we issued last week, we noted that IGs at uh, most of the federal agencies noted weaknesses in their agency's continuous monitoring capabilities. They either lacked appropriate policies and procedures or did not have uh, implemented over a large percentage of their devices. In addition, in those same reports, agencies reported themselves that their capability to have an automated monitoring capability over, uh, a, over a large percentage of their devices was non-existent at many of the agencies. For example, 14 of the 24 agencies reported that they had less than, uh, that they had an automated monitoring capabilities for uh, monitoring the security configurations for less than 60 percent of their devices. And that is a key development and as well as a key requirement to implement a continuous monitoring capability is be able to automatically monitor those on a frequent an ongoing basis because of the changes in computing environments, the changes in threats, as well as the uh, increasing interconnectivity of these uh, computer networks, it's imperative that agencies monitor on a more frequent basis than there has been. And under previously, uh, you referred to under the old regime of FISMA, if you will, mm -hmm. the law itself is pretty sound and based on fundamental security principles. I think it's been more of how OMB and perhaps NIST has uh, developed the reporting instructions mm -hmm. which led individual or agencies to focus on some of the what has been called a checklist approach to security. Uh, there is an emphasis on assuring that uh, each system was certified and accredited under the old reporting regime. Uh, and as a result, agencies spent a lot of money to have certification accreditation reports uh, prepared. Sometimes they were frequently out of date before too long. Yeah. So the continuous monitoring capability, which is designed to help improve that situation, may once it becomes more fully mature at the agencies. And another issue, um, you mentioned um, the ability to, for example, secure mobile devices and so forth. A lot of this comes down to procurement and the ability for agencies to buy these capabilities in a timely fashion to ensure that they can stay on top of the threat. So how can federal government work better with industry to be able to acquire the services and the products they need to better protect themselves? Well, one is to leverage the buying power of the federal government. Uh, we saw with the encryption uh, uh, special buy arrangement that was created by GSA that federal agencies were able to achieve significant dollar savings through the use of volume discounts to uh, buy off the GSA schedule and through these special buy situations where they could achieve volume discounts and obtain a standardized set of encryption products at a more reasonable price. So one way would be to have those uh, government-wide type of purchasing agreements. And it, would that also improve the timeliness? Because I know sometimes these contracts to actually acquire these products can sometimes take years if you're talking about a large procurement. Um, with just the life cycle of a, of a given um, contract. Right. So and, how do you f and that's, make that faster? Right. Well, that's one of the uh, reported and potential benefits of cloud computing, mm. is that agencies would be able to provision increases in computing capabilities and capacity more promptly and timely. In our review of cloud computing, we found that at several agencies that we looked at, that they were, in fact, able to reduce the uh, amount of time necessary to acquire these uh, resources like new servers and, and, and that dramatically through these uh, case studies that we reviewed. This is C-SPAN's Communicators program. We're talking with Greg Wilshusen, who is the Director of Information Security Issues at the Government Accountability Office. New report out on the security of federal information that is available on our website, cspan.org slash communicators. Jill Itoro of the Washington Business Journal is also with us today. Uh, Mr. Wilshus, and again, just to follow up on Jill's question, is there a government-wide system or standard that is used for security information, or is it each agency does what each agency wants? There are government-wide standards. They're called Federal Information Processing Standards that are 
uh, developed and promulgated by the National Institute of Standards and Technology. In addition, NIST, or as it's called NIST, also issues special uh, publications. And these are information security guidelines that are recommended or suggested for federal agencies to use. Uh, in addition, OMB, Office of Management and Budget, issues policy memorandums uh, and as part of its oversight role of federal uh, activities. So there are government-wide policies and procedures as well as standards and, and that at the same time though, federal agencies need to assess the risk and apply those standards as they pertain to their own environments. So they're going to need to be able to assess the risk and determine which appropriate controls are uh, necessary to mitigate those risks in their own computing environments. Did the GAO in its report look at the framework for decision making and have any suggestions for that? Yes, in our review we do look at the standards that uh, NIST and OMB has established for federal agencies and monitor the extent to which federal agencies have implemented that. Under FISMA, GAO is responsible for assessing the security uh, at federal agencies and compliance with the provisions of the Act. So that's the other side is federal law is another requirement for agencies to follow. And in our report, we do address how well federal agencies were meeting those requirements based on the work that GAO has performed as well as the work that agency IGs and agencies themselves have issued reports on information. And in your report, you say that 11 of the 24 agencies have significant deficiencies when it comes to protecting information on federal systems. What do you mean by significant deficiencies? Okay, that statistic dealt with the results of the financial statement audits at the federal agencies. And so as part of an agency's uh, audit, or as part of an audit of an agency's financial statements, the auditors are supposed to review their in, the agency's internal controls over financial resources and reporting. A key component of an agency's internal control are the controls over the federal, over the financial systems. What that shows is that actually it's not only eight that show, or 11 that shows significant deficiencies, but also eight they had a material weakness, which is even more severe uh, in terms of that. And what a significant deficiency is, is that it's likely that a, an error or misstatement in an agency's financial statement would, would occur uh, be, and not be detected through the normal course of the agency's internal control process because of the weaknesses in IT security. The eight that had a material weakness means that basically the same thing except that the misstatement could be material to the financial statement for reporting, financial reporting purposes. Um, we hear obviously a, a lot and are talking a lot about the state of federal cybersecurity, mm -hmm. but um, needless to say some of the biggest risks that we face have to do with our critical infrastructure, transportation systems, power mm -hmm. plants, that sort of thing. And it, it's up for debate how much control the federal government should have over that. So what is the state of security for the, phys uh, the physical infrastructure of the U.S., what kind of control does the federal government have and is that changing? Well, clearly, you know, uh, the federal government is not only reliant on the critical infrastructures for its own operations, but also has a role to play with the private sector to help protect those critical infrastructures because they are uh, extremely important to the national security and economic security as well as public health and safety of the nation. Mm -hmm. Uh, the presently, the federal government, particularly through DHS and other uh, lead agencies for specific sectors of the private sector, has established what is known as a public-private partnership in which federal government uh, is working with the private sector to help them secure these critical infrastructures. We issued a report last year that showed that the expectations of the private sector industry groups with this partnership model were largely not being met. What they expected from their federal partners were to provide timely and, action and actionable threat and alert information. Uh, in fact, 98% of the respondents to our survey indicated that this was very important to them. But only 27% of those respondents said that they were, those expectations were being largely met by the federal government. At the same time, the federal government also had some concerns about the uh, sharing of information on the part of the private sector. 
in that uh, several agencies felt that the private sector was not sharing uh, incident information to them in a timely manner uh, in order to be able to use in informing others. So that has been uh, a key component within the federal efforts to uh, assure that cyber-reliant critical infrastructures are being adequately protected. And there's still more needs to be done. Well, and I imagine the private sector is somewhat concerned about sharing the information because they could be held responsible to some degree. Um, mm -hmm. Is there efforts from the federal side of things to enable them to more um, easily and readily be able to come forward? Well, yes, there are. And one of the areas is with threat information or security incident information, federal government has mechanisms to try to anonymize that mm -hmm. information so it's not readily apparent from which company or organization it came from. In addition, the Department of Homeland Security has recently established the National Cybersecurity and Communications Integration Center, or NCIC. And this is a center that is to be used uh, not only among DHS and other civilian and as well as uh, defense organizations within the federal government, but also the private sector to, in order to share information, to monitor ongoing security threats and incidents and to help increase the collaboration and coordination between these different parties. Well and take that global because mm -hmm. needless to say um, other countries have their own policies in place and so forth. Is there a partnership, a collaboration, enough of a collaboration on the global mm -hmm. level with, uh, with our allies to address this problem and what do you do about those countries that are actually the ones targeting, targeting us in the first place? Right. And that's something we looked at also and issued a report last year on, on the, some of the global challenges and aspects of cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. And we had found that there were a number of different federal agencies involved in these, act in these efforts, and there are a number of different efforts underway with this. But there did not seem to be a central, coordinated, overarching strategy for maintaining and and and, and uh, uh, delivering, uh, not delivering, but uh, in in discussing these global aspects. Uh, now with the cybersecurity coordinator in place, mm -hmm. that should help. And recently they have come out with a global strategy. But we noticed a number of different challenges related to uh, the leadership on who was which agency and which group was to take the lead on. Um, addressing these aspects as well as just the different norms that different nations may have with regard to cybersecurity uh, and trying to uh, ensure that investigations were coordinated uh, throughout uh, the multiple organizations as you mentioned there are a number of different countries involved in uh, cyber attacks that can origi originate anywhere mm -hmm. across the globe and so there are a number of challenges associated with that. Greg Wilshus, and back to your report, you write, we have made hundreds of recommendations to agencies in fiscal years 2010 and 11 to address these security control deficiencies. However, most of these recommendations have not been fully implemented. Two-part question, mm -hmm. what kind of recommendations and what are the most serious in your view that have not been implemented? Okay, we make recommendations that span both management, operational, and technical controls. Many of our very specific technical control recommendations are those that result in improvements to the specific configurations or architectures of an agency's network or configurations of their specific devices, servers, routers, switches, uh, and databases uh, in their computing environment. We also make recommendations related to the weaknesses in the processes that agencies may have to uh, address security for example, there are processes for assessing the risk and developing a cost-effective security controls, as well as the processes then for testing and evaluating those controls and taking remedial action and correcting the vulnerabilities as they become known. And so we would have a number of recommendations that address these processes as well. And so we also look at the management side and have made recommendations to how well agencies assure that physical security and personnel security are adequately addressed in there. We find that generally agencies do agree with our recommendations and take corrective actions, but several of these have not yet fully been implemented in part because it takes some time to implement them. The ones that I would say are most critical 
are the ones that deal with the processes be, ensure that they take adequate steps to test and evaluate their systems and take corrective actions over known weaknesses because those will transcend uh, all types of technical control weaknesses and should also help address new threats and new vulnerabilities as they arise, as they frequently do. Now, Mr. Wilshus, we recently did a communicators uh, uh, segment where we talked about how much government spends on IT and IT security, and the figure was about 80 billion or something like this. What, how much is spent on protecting information? Is that something you delved into in your report? Well, it's something that OMB for the first time reported in its fiscal year 2010 FISMA report. And it noted that 15%, no, $12 billion were spent on IT security activities. And that comprised about 15% of the 80 billion of the total IT budgets within the federal government. And that is just over the 24 CFO Act agencies, the larger departments and agencies. Uh, the bulk of that, if, uh, of the costs, dealt with IT personnel costs. Um, relating to budgets, I and mean, we all heard about the drastic cuts that are going to happen as a result of the um, this, the, the debt deal um, to raise the ceiling and then more coming, um, 1.2 trillion in cuts happening over the next 10 years and so forth, if they even come up with some way of doing that. What from, where does cybersecurity stand in terms of seeing funding taken away and how will that impact the agencies? Well, that certainly is to be decided, you know, on to what extent cybersecurity uh, will be impacted by the uh, budget constraints that all federal agencies will be operating under. And certainly it could have an impact on how well agencies will be able to maintain and improve the security over their systems and networks. It will impact them to the extent that they will need to place greater emphasis in assessing their risk and identifying and prioritizing the key controls that help them to effectively mitigate those risks to an acceptable level. Mm -hmm. And so it will place a greater emphasis on prioritizing their information security work and assessing their risk and threats. And and, yeah, I'm sorry. Ahead, I was going to say that's a little frightening because you're saying, okay, what is most worth protecting or where can we kind of um, let our guard down to some degree? And I know in your report you said that agencies need to establish cybersecurity targets. I think that was one of your recommendations. What do you mean by targets and is it have to do with prioritizing to some degree? Well, it has to do primarily with the performance measures that have been established in which agencies are to report and OMB, DHS, and the Congress can then monitor the extent to which agencies are meeting their performance targets using these measures. So those targets relate to uh, identifying where agencies should be performing at a certain level mm -hmm. versus what they're actually reporting as meeting. And again, the report put out by the Government Accountability Office is available at cspan.org slash communicators. Greg Wilshusen is the Director of the Information Security Issues at the GAO. Jill Itoro, Senior Reporter at the Washington Business Journal. This has been The Communicators.